Good evening and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. For all in the nave, please be aware that the broadcast streaming of the service is now live for the cathedral's online congregation. Thank you.
spins around just don't let the spin get you down things are moving fast but hold on tight and you Pride. Get yourself in gear. Keep your stride. Never mind your fears. Never mind your fears. Better days will still be here. Take it from me someday. We'll all be free someday. We'll all be free. Yeah. Wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. Sleeping in bed. I was thinking, time for thinking ahead. The world has changed so very much from what it used to be. There is so much hatred, war and poverty. Oh, oh yeah. Wake up all the teachers, time to teach a new way. Teach a new way. Listen to what you have to say. Cause they're the ones who's coming up, and the world is in their hands. When you teach the children, teach them the very best you can. Just let it be. The world won't get no better. We gotta change again. Just you and me together, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. Can you sing along with us? We yeah. shall overcome. Sing along with me. We shall
Good evening and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. I am Mary Ann Buddy. I serve as the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. And on behalf of all of us here at Washington National Cathedral, we are so honored to co-host this event with the March on Washington Film Festival, an evening with the author Jonathan Eig discussing his most recent biography, King, A Life, uh, the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you know, there is not a preacher in this cathedral that has not stepped into that pulpit mindful of the fact that Dr. King preached the last Sunday sermon of his life here. And so we, we hold the memory of this man and his ministry in a particularly precious way, but also are tempted to do the very thing that Dr. Eig warns us all against, which is to make a myth of a man who was, um, at the time he preached that sermon, one of the most unpopular men in America. And so one of the things we're going to discuss tonight is the man, Dr. Martin Luther King, and the history of the nation that birthed him and that in the movement in which he dedicated his life. And we are so honored that you're here. We will have time for questions from the audience here at seated in the cathedral and also from those of you online that you can, there's a QR code in your, in your bulletin that you can use to type in a question or for those of you online, you can do so um, using the link on your computers um, when that time in the evening comes. Good evening. On behalf of the March on Washington Film Festival, I'd like to thank our host, the Washington National Cathedral, Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas, Bishop Mary Marianne Edgar Buddy, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and of course, for writing the acclaimed book that brought us all together, Dr. Jonathan Eig. And all of you, our guests here at the cathedral, as well as those who are viewing through the live stream. For more than a decade, the March on Washington Film Festival has served as the vault where history and truth-telling are protected from distortion and preserved for those who welcome the complexities, discomfort, and joy embedded in the civil rights narrative as, as it was and as it is today. Through year-round programming for both students and professionals and the annual festival this year, Pulpits, Protest, and Power, the Church and the Civil Rights Movement, being held September 28th through October 1st. The March on Washington Film Festival elevates the culture for the purpose of keeping us all connected to the stories we think we know, have never heard, and the stories that inspire us to be so much more, like Dr. Ide's new book. And now, it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome someone else who inspires us to reach beyond our country's limited beliefs encourages us to claim our power, supports us in protecting all of our rights, and advocates for the preservation of our democracy. Representing the 7th District of Massachusetts, please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Good evening, beloved community, and thank you. Thank you, Washington National Cathedral. Thank you, March on Washington Film Festival. Thank you, Bishop Buddy, Reverend Douglas, and everyone gathered here this evening. It is truly a surreal and humbling honor to stand before you in this sacred cathedral, in this sacred moment, at this critical inflection point in our nation's history. When we reflect on Dr. King and his legacy, we often recall him as a spiritual and moral leader, a scholar and thought leader, and an early architect of the civil rights movement. Often King is singularly characterized as a peaceful protester with a dream. When we know that the whole truth, as Mr. Ige's new book makes plain, is Dr. King was a proud and unapologetic black man, a prophetic preacher and radical dreamer, 
with a bold vision and a desire for revolutionary change. I'll underscore that one more time. Dr. King was a proud and unapologetic black man, a prophetic preacher and radical dreamer with a bold vision and desire for revolutionary change. He was a disruptive movement builder, disruptive because he sought to upend the legislated status quo and to reverse the hurt and harms of policy violence that have denied black Americans our full rights and freedoms. His vision was a radical one, considered bold for the times and perhaps bold by many still today. Full inclusion, equity, a redistribution of wealth and resources, and voting rights. In word and in deed, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sought to affirm that black lives matter. 55 years ago, mere days before his assassination, Dr. King stood in this pulpit and spoke of the need to remain awake through a great revolution, to be aware of the challenges still present here and across the globe, to eradicate racial injustice and rid our nation and the world of poverty. And perhaps most importantly, he reminded us that we are one human family, that our freedoms and our destinies are inextricably tied, that what happens to one of us should be the business of all of us. As I revisited Dr. King's words, I was struck but not surprised by how relevant and resonant these words are to this moment we find ourselves in today. Today, we live in a world where poverty, inequality, and racial injustice remain the status quo. The three evils of militarism, racism, and poverty that King worked actively to disrupt are daily more entrenched. I represent the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, a vibrant, diverse, dynamic district, and also one of the most unequal in our nation. In a three-mile radius, life expectancy drops by 30 years from Cambridge to predominantly black Roxbury, where according to the Federal Reserve of Boston in their Color of Wealth report, the median net worth of a black Boston family is $8 and that of a white family is nearly $250,000. And when we look at our country as a whole, the racial wealth gap is over $10 trillion. That's trillion with a T. A shameful reality and a damning commentary for the wealthiest nation in our world. You know, much has been said and written about how America, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, underwent a so-called reckoning on racial injustice. I see no evidence of that. As someone who was raised in a storefront church on the south side of Chicago at the knee of my grandfather, Reverend James E. Eccles, and as a student of Reverend Barber, I don't play with words like reckoning. A reckoning is something of biblical, epic proportions, and we are simply not there yet. We have yet to see a response commiserate to the harm that black folks have experienced for generations. Instead, we live in a world where the legislative and social progress we've made, thanks to Dr. King, Coretta Scott King, and others, are under attack daily, where after this summer of so-called reckoning, we see the forces of injustice and white supremacy pushing and lashing back and rolling back gains made in civil and human rights. A devastating reminder that gains are not guaranteed. Gains are not guaranteed when inaction, inaction, inertia, and insurrection thrive. Gains are not guaranteed when the white moderate is complicit and white supremacy is emboldened. Gains are not guaranteed when today's boycotts are short-lived, 
faith is shallow and second-class citizenship is accepted as inevitable. Gains are not guaranteed when we merely are grateful to be at the table, but unwilling to shake it. Although we are not in the midst of a true reckoning, I do believe that we are in the midst of a shift. And my very existence and election are evidence of this. A power shift, one that is being led by a super majority of the most marginalized. You see, it is one thing to celebrate diversity with flag raisings and holidays and parade pins, but it is another thing altogether to be confronted with the prospect of shared power. We are long overdue for some guarantees. Preservation and expansion of the gains made and new gains made real. But I know ultimately we will only see systemic, transformative change for black folks and all marginalized people when we are advancing policies and budgets that codify the value of black lives, center our humanity, our dignity, invest in our genius, and promote the promise of equal access, opportunity, and justice. And it is time that we build a truly just and equitable America as Dr. King intended for all God's children. Parents are a child's first teacher. I had two extraordinary ones in my parents. My mother, Sandy, may she rest in peace and power, and my father, Martin, made sure I knew that it was a beautiful thing to be black and something that I should be proud of. I was told this throughout my formative years. But they also wanted their baby girl to know that she was being born into a struggle. And they had an expectation that I would do my part, play a role in that struggle, in the fight for justice and our collective liberation. At 49 years old, I've learned the work of liberation is a lifelong struggle. And so far as I see it, we are still in the civil rights movement. Now, despite what history books may tell us and the news may report, the civil rights movement did not begin and end with Rosa taking a seat, John crossing a bridge, and Martin leading a march. The movement was more than three leaders with three actions, and the same must be true today. In order for the movement to survive and for change to be actualized. Indeed, change can't wait. When Jim Crow is still alive in front and all around us, Jim Crow is not behind us when the Senate filibuster is preserved. Jim Crow is not behind us when state laws have been introduced to disenfranchise our votes, erase our history, and restrict our bodily autonomy. Jim Crow is not behind us. It is not behind us when black home ownership is the lowest it's been in decades, and black students bear the burden of a nearly $2 trillion student debt crisis. Jim Crow is not behind us when police brutality is the sixth leading cause of death for black men and black women are still four times more likely to die in childbirth. No, Jim Crow is not behind us when black Americans make up 13% of the U.S. population and 40% of those incarcerated behind the wall. Jim Crow is not behind us when childcare and home workers, majority black and brown women, don't earn a living wage. Or when black women are paid only 63 cents for every dollar paid to white men. Jim Crow is not behind us. And we are still in the civil rights movement. 
when the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and John Lewis Voting Rights Act and constitutional gender equality and federal reparations are not yet the law of the land. Jim Crow was still alive in front and all around us. Earlier, I spoke of the revision and erasure of core components of Dr. King's message, vision, and dream. That erasure or revisionist history has also been true for the role that Coretta played in his life and in the movement as well. For those who may be unaware, Martin and Coretta forged their love in the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District in Boston, in Roxbury, at the historic 12th Baptist Church. What a credible reminder and demonstration of the power of love, of the power of black love, of the power of black radical love to birth movements. Long before there was the movement, before there was Montgomery, there was Boston. Coretta has often singularly been characterized as a devoted wife. In fact, she was, but she was also a trusted confidant, advisor, effective strategist and activist in her own right. Dr. King didn't radicalize Coretta. He fell in love with her because she was already radicalized. She stoked our consciousness and reminded us that every disparity, hardship, and social ill is the result of a policy or a budget choice, a violent choice at that. I believe in the power of the movement, of the pulpit, and of the pen. Policy is my love language because it is policy that has caused us generational hurt and harm. It is discriminatory, short-sighted, precise policy and unjust budgets. Systemic racial injustice is the consequence of that. And although no single bill can undo centuries of harm, I firmly believe if we can legislate hurt and harm, we can and we must legislate equity, healing, and justice. In his final sermon, Dr. King inspired us, called us to remain active and engaged during periods of great social change, lest we risk halting the progress our answers fought, bled, and died for. In his prophetic words, human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. King was right. It is easy to become dispirited or apathetic. Lord knows I get weary, we all do. Given the political landscape and the climate that we find ourselves in, but we haven't the luxury of time because change can't wait. Instead, we must practice the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism and fortitude over fatalism. Dr. King challenged us to remain awake during the revolution. But not only must we remain awake, we must also remain vigilant and relentless in the pursuit of justice. When I need strength to go forward, I take stock of our past. This weekend, many of us will gather in the community to celebrate Juneteenth. Freedom Day, a truth-telling reminder of our nation's history and founding and also of what is possible. When my enslaved ancestors began the work of abolition, many considered the goal of freedom an improbable or impossible one. 
But because of their imaginations and sacrifice, it did happen. Because of them, I am. Because of them, I know anything is possible. Another world is possible. One where we put people over profits, joy over trauma, freedom over fear, a world where healthcare and housing are a human right, and where black boy joy is a rite of passage, and black men grow old. I want to live in that world. There is no deficit of resource in our country, only a deficit of imagination, empathy, and political will. In 1968, Dr. King gave us the call to action to remain awake in the midst of a revolution. In 2023, there are dark, draconian forces at work that want to lull us into a permanent sleep state with their false truths, fear-mongering, and hate. They have enlisted accomplices in their extremist agenda in the march towards fascism and authoritarianism. From school committees to city hall and state houses, from the lower courts to the Supreme Court and all the way to the halls of Congress. This is the revolution that we remain in the midst of. Beloved, stay awake and someday we'll all be free. Perhaps another round of applause for the Congresswoman as she continues. Ooh. Kenan Douglas, Jonathan Eig, welcome to this platform for what I trust will be the second installment of an amazing evening. And um, Jonathan, I'd like to give you the first word and ask you to read a bit from the prologue of your biography, King of Life. Thank you, I'd be honored, and um, I'm honored to be in this place, this um, great and significant cathedral, as Dr. King called it, uh, with both of you tonight. Um, before King, the promises contained in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution had been hollow. King and the other leaders of the 20th century civil rights movement along with millions of ordinary protesters, demanded that America live up to its stated ideals. They fought without muskets, without money, and without political power. They built their revolution on Christian love, on nonviolence, and on faith in humankind. This book tells the story of the man who, in a career that spanned a mere 13 years, brought the nation closer than it had ever been to reckoning with the reality of having treated people as property and secondary citizens. That he failed to fully achieve his goal should not diminish his heroism any more than the failure of the original Founding Fathers diminished theirs. To help readers better understand King's struggle, this book seeks to separate, seek, I'm sorry, seeks to recover the real man from the gray mist of hagiography. In the process of canonizing King, we've defanged him, replacing his complicated politics with philosophy and catchphrases that suit one ideology or another. We've heard the recording of his I Have a Dream speech so many times we don't really hear it anymore. 
We no longer register its cry for America to recognize the unspeakable horrors of police brutality or its petition for economic reparations. We don't appreciate that King was making demands, not wishes. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check, he said that summer day in 1963 as he stood at the foot of Abraham Lincoln's statue. We've mistaken King's nonviolence for passivity. We've forgotten that his approach was more aggressive than anything the country had seen, that he used peaceful protest as a lever to force those in power to give up many of the privileges they'd hoarded. We've failed to recall that King was one of the most brutally divisive figures in American history, attacked not only by segregationists in the South, but also by his own government, by more militant black activists, and by white northern liberals. He was deliberately mischaracterized in his lifetime, and he remains so today. King was a man, not a saint, not a symbol. He chewed his fingernails. He shouted at the TV during quiz shows. He hid his cigarettes from his children. He had a little white dog named Topsy. He bore a scar on his chest where, in 1958, surgeons extricated an ivory-handled letter opener lodged beside his aorta. He had skin so sensitive he couldn't use a razor. He slept poorly but napped well. He ran chronically late for meetings. As an adolescent, he twice attempted suicide, although perhaps half-heartedly. As an adult, he was hospitalized repeatedly for what he called exhaustion and others described as depression. He possessed a wicked sense of humor, improved by the knowledge that certain jokes were funnier coming from a Baptist minister. He depended on his wife, Coretta, in ways few people understood at the time. He also cheated on her continually, continually, even when he knew the FBI was tapping his phones and bugging his hotel rooms, trying to destroy his marriage and reputation. He maintained one intimate relationship for so long that friends referred to the woman as his second wife. He was a man who announced at an early age that God had called him to act. He lived his life accordingly, and he was willing to die. This book represents an attempt to observe, to observe King's life as it was lived, and through that life to better understand his times and our own. The portrait that emerges here may trouble some people, but those closest to King saw his flaws all along and understood that his power grew from his ability to grapple with contradiction, to wrestle with doubt, just as his biblical heroes did. Great men have not been boasters and buffoons, wrote Emerson, but perceivers of the terror of life and have manned themselves to face it. King faced it and challenged his followers to face it too. He asked his supporters to love Birmingham lawman Bull Connor, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, and others who enforced the laws and customs of white supremacy. King understood that President Lyndon B. Johnson could be one of his greatest allies and one of his most dangerous enemies. He pushed white liberals to confront their own racist behaviors, even as it cost him their support. King felt despair. He felt misunderstood. But when pressure against him grew and he might have backed down, he stepped up, time after time, despite the obvious risk. He warned that materialism undermined our moral values, that nationalism threatened to crush all hope of universal brotherhood, that militarism bred cynicism and distrust. He saw a moral rot at the core of American life and worried that racism had blinded many of us to it. He called himself a victim of deferred dreams, of blasted hope. He also insisted that we must never lose infinite hope. He never did. So much in that um, portion of your prologue. Um, you also describe in that, um, in that prologue the reasons why you felt that the world needed a biography of King now. And I wonder if you might briefly describe how you came to that conclusion and what was the inspiration for you to take on this, uh, this uh, monumental task. Thank you. Um, it happened fairly organically. It started here in Washington, actually, one day when I was having breakfast with Dick Gregory while I was working on my biography of Muhammad Ali. And Dick Gregory made a comment. He talked a little bit about King because he knew him so well. And I began to become curious what was King like? What was it like to spend time with him? And Dick Gregory said something to me like, you know the difference between Martin Luther King and Jesus? And he paused and I was waiting to see if it was a joke or riddle of some kind. And he said, well, we have, we have video of Martin Luther King. We have audio tape. He was real. 
And I'm still thinking about that. That was, that was deep. Um, definitely not a, a joke. Um, but that's when it occurred to me that there were still people around who knew Dr. King and that there was an opportunity to spend time with them, to interview them, because I felt like what we had done in my lifetime, I'm born in 1964, um, in my lifetime, I feel like we've seen his image dulled. We've seen it candy-coated. We've turned the I have a dream speech into a kindergarten lesson, and we haven't progressed much beyond that kindergarten lesson. And, it, and we're teaching the simplest, most comfortable version of King that we can all the way through into adulthood. We don't read his own words. We don't read his books. Um, and we forget, even in the I have a dream speech, that the first half of that speech, before he began improvising, before he went to church, um, he talked about police brutality. He talked about income inequality. He, it was the march for jobs and freedom. And he meant freedom in the broadest possible terms. So I wanted to write a book that would introduce readers to a more human king, a more intimate portrait than we've gotten from some of the wonderful civil rights books that are out there. And to remind us that he was a radical, not just at the end of his life, but all through his life. I've been listening. I've been listening to a number of your interviews and podcasts around the country, and one of the things that, that I would love for you to reflect on is um, often when you're asked what kept him going, what motivated him, you speak of his faith. And, you know, it's one thing for those of us in the church to point to his faith as a grounding piece of motivation, but you're a journalist, you know, and you have the whole scope of motivations that drive a human being, and you write of them. But when pushed, that's your answer. And I wonder if you might speak about that. That's a great question. And the first time I was asked that question, because King is abused, he's beaten, he's, you know, he grows up in a family that's been beaten and abused by racism. And then he sets out to do something about it, and he's time after time batted down, harassed by his own government, what keeps him going? And the first time someone asked me that question as I began talking about the book, the answer just came right out. I didn't even think about it. God. His faith in God, his, his Christianity was his bedrock. There is no Martin Luther King. He does not become who he is without Christianity. And he's trying to do what he believes and what the Bible teaches us to do. The Bible says quite clearly that we are all made in God's image. We are all meant to love each other. It's pretty simple. Um, I don't have to tell you two about that, but it struck me really profoundly to think that everything King did throughout his life, throughout, even as he becomes famous and powerful and dealing with presidents, that he is the rare individual who is still being guided completely by his faith, that he is not compromising. And that still gives me goosebumps. Ken and Douglas, I wonder if you might jump in on this one, uh, the questions of, of faith and, and influences that brought Dr. King to be the man that he was. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Buddy. And yes, you, thank you for your book. And thank you for, we often make our leaders into heroes and we romanticize them and forget that they're human beings. And even when they're doing extraordinary work as, as King was doing uh, for, for this nation. But you do situate well King in the black church tradition and really highlight his faith is that which drove him as it did. And oftentimes biographies don't situate him uh, in the black church and uh, talk about the influence of some of uh, those he studied uh, in graduate school. As you do that, <laughs> you speak of the social gospel movement and you speak of the impact of the social gospel movement uh, particularly on some of King's mentors, be it Mordecai Johnson, be it Benjamin Mays, or even Howard Thurman. But as you do that, you speak of the social gospel movement in relationship to the white social gospel movement. You highlight uh, figures like uh, Rauschenbusch, right? And King, yes, read those. But what's 
not there, and I'd love to hear you speak on it, is the black social gospel movement, which is a movement that predates Walter Rauschenbusch, predates the white social gospel movement that emerges uh, out of the abolitionist movement and where, in which King was born into, right? Um, which indeed, uh, they began to talk about not simply personal salvation, but social salvation, social sin, and uh, that you had to talk about systems and structures if you were gonna talk about salvation, way back with uh, the abolitionist movement. So can you, I'd love to hear you speak on that and uh, you know, when you talk about the impact of the social gospel movement, is there, any understanding or the context of the black social gospel movement, which is different and separate from the white social gospel movement? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that you can't really imagine Martin Luther King without the black social gospel movement. And I think it's so deeply baked into his DNA that perhaps I even overlook it in terms of addressing it and labeling it. And that might be one of my weaknesses coming at this as a journalist and not a theologian. I find that I often miss some of the the terms that are familiar, but I think that it is threaded through everything, not just in his life, but in his ancestor's life. You know, I opened the book, and I had this decision to open the book um, after talking to um, Professor Lewis Baldwin, who has written a lot about the black social gospel. I had originally opened the book with a scene that, with Martin Luther King's father and grandfather going into Stockbridge, Georgia to try to sell their cotton and being mistreated, being ripped off by the white landowner, and it was Professor Baldwin who said to me, have you thought about perhaps opening the book instead with King's grandmother, instead of his grandfather? Because his grandmother was a believer. His grandmother lived the black social gospel. She went to church every Sunday, and she, though they were dirt poor, they were sharecroppers in Stockbridge, she was the one who gave a portion of their, their little bit of food to neighbors who had even less. She lived it, and King is so steeped, you know, religion for them, was, as, as you can address far better than I can, it was the only thing that white people couldn't take away from them. It was the only thing they owned. They had their own church. The pastor in town could not be fired for speaking about liberation, for speaking about the fact that faith is incompatible with racism. And that's such a deep part. I felt like, I hope the readers get that, even if I don't throw the, the, word black, the words black social gospel around as often as, as perhaps I should have. But I, I couldn't agree with you more that there's no way that this country produces a Martin Luther King without the black social gospel. Can I, can I follow up a little sure. bit on that? Yes, in, in that regard. And, and even the distinction, because you do speak of this uh, in the book as well, in terms of uh, those that were antagonists uh, to King and how we've in so many ways misremembered uh, who he was in relationship to uh, the way in which he challenged uh, not only the country, but the church and even the black church, right? Because this, it was one thing for the black church as it is historically done to speak about the liberation and freedom and racism and that is a sin. It's another thing then to be engaged in a social movement for racial justice. So that there is the tradition of always speaking against and always naming racism as a sin. But then there's the black social gospel movement, which a J.H. Jackson, as you speak of, the National Bank, and others did not support and did not support King. And it was a minority in the black church. It was a minority black social gospel movement historically that King emerged out of, that Mordecai Johnson and those that you uh, name uh, emerged out of. So again, could you even say more about King and not only in relationship to the white church, but the black church and wider society and that King was really out there uh, not on an island, but he was this prophetic voice, even pushing yes. his own tradition. Yeah, we forget that he was pushing even his father. His father signed the Ebenezer Baptist Choir up to perform, to dress in the clothes of enslaved people and to sing at the premiere of Gone with the Wind in Atlanta. His father was deeply, was heavily criticized by other Atlanta preachers for that. And young Martin Luther King at age 10 is sitting in the front row dressed in these, these rags singing along. 
Um, but even when King goes to Montgomery and begins the bus boycott, his father is saying, don't do it, it's too dangerous. When he goes to Birmingham, the leading black preachers don't show up at the airport to greet him. They're nervous. They're not sure they want to get on this, go down this path with him. And the same thing happens when he goes to Chicago in 1966. He cannot really rally the support of the entire black community. One of King's great powers is that he's able to reconcile. He's able to get people who are not necessarily in, aligned with him to rethink their positions, including a lot of white liberals in the North who are induct, conducting their own racist behavior, their own segregated communities, but, but King forces them to rethink things. Um, and, and even some white segregationists, when he calls on the Bible, when he calls on the Constitution, when he talks about how black people can lead us toward a better understanding of both the Bible and the Constitution, it has an ability to reach beyond his core group of followers, but he's deeply frustrated, as the letter from Birmingham Jail illustrates, he's deeply frustrated that even faith leaders are afraid to take, those, take that risk and go as far as he wants them to go. One of the truly revelatory parts of reading your book, Jonathan, is um, what I experienced as kind of uh, a, an almost a pattern or an arc of the pivotal events in King's life um, and how he brought, he had the ability to bring things or he found himself in these crucible moments um, or placed himself in them. Um, bringing about some of the changes that we still point to as the hallmarks of that era. And then what he experienced afterwards, um, both emotionally and in terms of what we might call even a, a backlash. And I wonder if you might pick one of those moments and just walk us through, whichever one you want, Montgomery, Birmingham, pick one and just describe the arc kind of from beginning to end in, in broad terms, how that was for him, the man, as he was going through that. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to do two. Um, one, the first one is Montgomery. Um, he's 26 years old. He's been in town for about a year. He's taken over this new church, and it's considered a fairly conservative church. He's not throwing himself into the firestorm of protest. Birmingham is already a cauldron. There's already a lot of a, unrest about racism and segregation. But King doesn't think he's getting involved in any of that when he takes this job. And in fact, he turns down several uh, offers to become involved in protests because he's busy raising a family, he's got a new baby, he's still getting used to his congregation. And when the Montgomery bus boycott begins, when Rosa Parks refuses to get up and the community calls a meeting to decide what to do, and they're really not sure what they're going to do, King is asked to become the spokesman, to give the big, the keynote address that night. Why? It's not because he's the most famous or even the most powerful preacher in town. It's because he's new and nobody really ha has a gripe with him yet. And he has a reputation for being a pretty good speaker. So he has 20 minutes to prepare for his speech that night. He goes home, rushes home, tells Coretta, I don't know what I just agreed to do, but I've got 20 minutes to write the biggest speech of my life. He goes back to his little study in, in their parsonage and he has a panic attack literally has a panic attack, can't breathe. Somehow he clears his head, he has 10 minutes now, he jots some notes, rushes to the church, Holt Street Baptist Church, which is the biggest church in town, and there's thousands of people cramming the church, spilling out onto the street. King can't even get his car near the church because the streets are mobbed, and people are setting up loudspeakers outside the church so the people who can't get in can hear what he has to say. And he goes and he says, God speaks for him. And he stands there and says, he begins kind of flatly, he says, we're here tonight for serious business. But we're here tonight to show that the black people of America may be able to lead us toward fulfilling what the Constitution has long promised but failed to deliver. We may be able to show not just the people of Montgomery, but the people of the world that God tells us that we are all equal. And that if we are wrong in that, then the Bible is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution is wrong. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of the United States is wrong. And you can hear the crowd, because we have a recording of this. Coretta at the last minute said, take a tape recorder. She had to stay home with the baby. 
and we can talk later about Coretta's many sacrifices. But in that moment, King finds his voice. He finds this message, um, and it connects directly to the black social gospel. This idea that racism is systemic and it is incompatible with our beliefs in, in all religions, all faiths. And he becomes almost overnight a star. The world wants to hear from him. The media begins descending. And he finds that he has this ability to speak to audiences far beyond his church. And this is the moment when he is thrust into leadership without ever wanting it. And the backlash to that, as you addressed, is, is tremendous. His home, just a few weeks later, is, is bombed with dynamite while his wife and daughter are sleeping inside. And soon after that, shotgun through the window. Daddy King, his father, comes and says, you got to get out of here, you're leaving. And he says, no, I'm staying. And in that moment, King accepts this mantle of leadership that he will carry with him for the rest of his life. But there's always a backlash because the next movement, he's deemed a failure. It's not working anymore. And the second mo moment that I want to just briefly address is his most iconic moment, the March on Washington. Because this is the moment that I think King comes closest to really fulfilling his vision, fulfilling his prophecy that we can unite. We people see on television this image of black and white people literally holding hands and singing in harmony. And they walk away from that moment believing that America might finally be ready to turn a corner, to leave the racism behind us, to become a better society, to really embrace equal justice for all. And three days after that moment, the FBI produces a memo that says, Martin Luther King must be marked as the most dangerous man in America. So that's your backlash. That's the, 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 the white supremacy, the status quo must be preserved. And, and that's you know, what King faced all his life. And I also, I just want to add a couple of other pieces to that just broke my heart every time I think of it. Um, first of all, the collateral damage after Montgomery when the desegregation orders were in fact granted. But then you describe what happens to the city of Montgomery when the white power structure just basically decides to strike back, right? And even maybe more poignantly after the march on Washington with the bombing of the church in Birmingham, right. which is like just a couple of weeks later, That's right? That's right, at the 16th Street Church so, I mean, I think it's, in Birmingham it's, is bombed. So would you just reflect on that, just the sense of like what, there's, a, there's, a, there's an accomplishment, there's a victory, and then there's this massive wave of yeah. violence or, of, as you described, uh, resistance. Yeah, almost every time. And in Montgomery, after the bus boycott was so successful, the leaders decided that the next move would be to try to integrate the city parks. Right. And what did the city of Montgomery do? They shut down all the all parks. The they parks. sold off all the zoo animals. They walled off Central Park, which was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, this jewel of the city, so that black people couldn't walk through it, couldn't visit it. They just, they shut it down entirely. White people wouldn't have access to it either. They would rather have no parks than grant these protesters than grant the black community the same access that the white people had. And then you see the same thing happen all over the country after Brown versus Board of Education. You see school districts shutting down in some cases rather than admit. So the black, the, the backlash to any advancement that not just King, but this is throughout all of American history. Anytime, uh, look at you know, Reconstruction. Anytime you see progress, there's a reaction to that progress because the, the status quo must be maintained. So something to be, expect <laughs> something to be expected and factored in. I, uh, Canada Douglas, I would love for you to add your voice now in terms of some of the, and, and to, to talk with Jonathan about the other people that surrounded the movement, as the, as the Congresswoman said so well, you know, there was King and then there were all the others and, and particularly some of the women that were part of the groundswell of leadership of that time. No, thank you. And yes, two, two uh, things take me there that you uh, said even this evening, uh, Jonathan, and one, of course, about his uh, mother 
and how uh, Louis Baldwin said, oh, you should have started with his mother, uh, because that uh, she exemplified or embodied uh, more the black social gospel movement. And we know that there were women that were very significant in the black social gospel movement from Ida B. Wells to Nanny uh, Helen Burroughs, and we continue on up through King and the Civil Rights Movement and Ella Baker, uh, Dorothy Hyde, Pauli Murray, uh, all out of that tradition and very significant, yet we get to the March on Washington and they are excluded from that march. And they protest their exclusion from that march. And you know, he, they concede to let uh, Rosa Parks sit on uh, the dais or at the platform and Marian Anderson I think sings. Uh, yet there's no Ella Baker, who without Ella Baker, there's no, in many respects, SCLC and SNCC. There's no Pauli Murray. Without Pauli Murray, there's no Brown v. Board of the Education. Uh, to, there's no Dorothy Hyatt, who writes both King and A. Philip Randolph about women's exclusion. Can you speak a little bit about this? King can talk about uh, the image of God in all of us and all of humanity, but he's pretty bad on sexism. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And um, a big point of my book is that we don't have to be perfect to be heroes. And this is a great example because King had a serious weakness, a serious blind spot here. Some of it is a product of his times. And Ella Baker said the big problem with the SCLC was that they were all black Baptist preachers and they were raised um, in this community, in this society at a time when women had no positions of power, no, were not given any responsibilities. And King um, unfortunately exemplified that. And he had so many opportunities because he, he, Ella Baker, you know, really bailed him out many times. Dorothy Cotton, he absolutely respected. Uh, his wife, Coretta Scott King, is, is one of the great heroes in American history. She was a greater activist, more experienced activist than he was when they met. And I think that's a big part of what attracted to him to her. And yet, he was not able to turn the corner and embrace the opportunities that she offered to embrace the asset that she was and all that she could have done for the movement because he expected her to be a pastor's wife and to stay home. And we see that time and again. Um, you know, King responded to that letter when asked why there were no women and basically said, because that's the way it is. He was not prepared to make any, any changes. Yet what's interesting in this regard is that King you know, we can talk about it as a uh, aspect of the times, and uh, we can talk about it as a part of a black Baptist male culture, uh, as Ella Baker uh, does. But she also uh, just spoke about, you know, sort of King's sense of self uh, to, and, and the leadership model, rightly or wrongly, and people critique Ella Baker even for that. While King wasn't able to step out of that in relationship to allowing women to have more power uh, within the movement or just recognize their significance, he was able to step out of it in relationship to Bayard Rustin, right? And because Bayard Rustin uh, was out as a gay man and he was attacked for that uh, and many people encouraged King to back away from Bayard Rustin. Uh, at some points King did, but he always came back because he recognized that he needed Bayard Rustin. And so he took that risk, but he wasn't able to take that risk with the women. What's going on here? I don't know. It, I'd like to sing King's praises for being brave enough to keep Bayard Rustin in the fold and to insist that he was going to, and, and remember, Bayard Rustin was also bringing heat from the FBI because of his former communist ties. So when King, uh, uh, when Robert F. Kennedy and JFK and, the, and J. Edgar Hoover start uh, authorizing these wiretaps, um, a big part of it is because they're concerned about King's connections to Bayard Rustin. So King had a lot of reasons to cut ties with Bayard, but he didn't. He obviously saw enormous value there and why he was able to see the value outweighed his own prejudices, because he was not great on issues of homosexuality. Um, in his advice column, which he wrote, um, he 
encouraged people to overcome their homosexuality, um, and that was the only solution he offered to people who were struggling with their feelings on the, uh, uh, in that area. Um, but he's able to overcome it and see the value that Bayard Rustin brings to the movement, but he's not able to see the same value that, that Dr. Murray or, um, or, or Ella Baker bring. And that's just something about the, the, the depths of his, of his own prejudices. Let, let's move to the, the latter part of his life and reflect with us about some of the the clarity that he comes to and why and what the implications are for him and for the country as he does. So I'm talking 67, early 68, obviously. We have a tendency to say that King became more radical in the last years of his life. I don't think it's true, really. And I'd be curious to see if you agree. I think that that radical Christianity was there all along. And I think it guided everything he did. But I think he was so focused on the immediate task of integration in those early years that he didn't have much chance um, or much air even to speak about other issues. But as he goes along, and I think Coretta plays a big part in this, you know, when he wins the Nobel Prize, another instance where there's a backlash, by the way, because that so infuriates J. Edgar Hoover that he doubles down on the surveillance and really begins trying much more aggressively to destroy King. But after King wins the Nobel Prize, it's, it's Coretta who says, we, not you, we have a greater responsibility than ever to think beyond integration and to look at issues of income inequality, hunger, militarism. And she is leading the way in many ways, especially on, on opposition to the Vietnam War. But King really commits, and again, this is back to his, his core faith. Christianity does not allow him to pick and choose his battles. He has to follow all of the words of God. He has to follow all of the commandments. And that means that he's, going to, he's not going to be silenced. One of the most painful moments um, in researching this book for me was reading King's, one of his last conversations. It was after his, one of his last conversations uh, with Stanley Levison, one of his dearest friends and closest advisors. After King gave his famous speech at Riverside Church in New York, where he said that America was the greatest purveyor of violence on earth, his friend Stan Levison calls him and says, I think that was a bad speech. I think it's King's greatest speech. King Levison says to him, I think it was a big mistake. It didn't even sound like you. You're going to cost us all of this support in the North. You're going to sever, you're going to destroy your relationship with whatever's left of it with President Johnson. And King says to him, and we know this because the FBI is taping the phone calls, King says to him, it may have been politically wrong, but it was not morally wrong. And he's never going to be judged by the Gallup polls in which his popularity is sinking. He's going to be judged by whether he lived up to the words in the Bible. And his friends, even his closest friends, can't understand that. But I think that's what he's been doing all along. It's just that he now feels the confidence, the courage, and the clarity to really put it in the broadest terms and to speak what's in his heart, not just what needs to be addressed at the moment. Ken and Douglas, we have just five minutes before we have to open, before we get to open it up to other questions. But I wonder, so you have the final, final exchange. Yeah, just one more. Yeah, yeah. Piggybacking on that question uh, that Bishop Buddy just asked you and what happens with King's clarity. What happens, can you talk about that sort of moment, and perhaps it's after the Birmingham bombing, when King recognizes that his dream becomes a nightmare? Yeah, you know, we talked about the sermon he gave here four days before his death. He had planned to give another sermon the next Sunday at his home church, Ebenezer, and that sermon was called America May Go to Hell. Now, he was pretty grim. He was, he had, he, he suffered, you know, a lot of doubts, a lot of dark moments in those, especially in those last years when he felt like no one was listening to him anymore. And we again hear him on these transcripts saying, if this march in Memphis doesn't go well, I'm done. He's losing confidence in himself, but he's not losing faith in God. 
even when he says America may go to hell, he still insists that there's hope. He still believes that there's a chance for redemption of these lost souls, for that there's, that there's still an opportunity for reconciliation. His faith is never dimmed, and I think that's what, you know, inspires me when we think about those, those last years. We're going to open it up for questions from others, and I think we're, people have been collecting the questions. Do I have that right? Here they come. Okay, settle in. We've got, we've got a few. Thank you so much, friends. Okay, a number of questions about the implications of the FBI docu um, documents around King. Um, the biggest surprise in the trove of documents released by the FBI and what you think the implication of the remaining FBI documents around King will be when they are declassified. Well, uh, let me say first of all that um, for the last three, four years, um, we've been getting dumps of new documents from the FBI. And what they mostly reveal is the intensity of the FBI's campaign against King. They don't reveal anything new that we didn't already know um, in terms of King's personal conduct. I also, in addition to those FBI documents, I was um, one of the first, maybe the first, to see the papers um, that LBJ's secretary was keeping in a safe that was directly sent directly from J. Edgar Hoover to LBJ. So what we didn't know was that in addition to the FBI wiretaps, there was a steady stream of information directly from the director of the FBI to the president of the United States, sometimes two or three memos a week, specifically about King's conduct and really heightened when King began speaking out against the Vietnam War. This became an obsession, not just for J. Edgar Hoover, but for the president. And what that tells me is that the campaign against King was not just one of, uh, driven by the racism of J. Edgar Hoover, which we should not diminish, but we should also acknowledge that it was, that the president was encouraging this conduct, that he was specifically encouraging the FBI to release the information to the media, and that the, the media, while they refrained from printing the salacious stories about King's personal life, they, f they did not print the bigger story, which they could have printed, about the FBI's surveillance of a private citizen. So to me, the big takeaway um, from the FBI documents is not so much what King was doing. Uh, we know that he was imperfect. We know that he um, cheated on his wife. But the big takeaway for me is how that information was weaponized to try to destroy King, try to break up his marriage, and to try to divide and conquer the civil rights movement. Uh, because there was, it was perceived as a serious threat, once again, to the, the power structure as it stood at the time. I think you mentioned in your book as well, there was no protection for King, right? There was no, no, there wasn't any effort by the FBI to protect him from others that might seek to do him harm. So another implication of that cost. Um, much has been made of your finding that Martin Luther King did not state that Malcolm X has done himself and our people a great disservice. So. Does it follow then that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were more in concert with their beliefs than was perceived at the time? No question about that. I think James Baldwin wrote that they were fairly indistinguishable in their philosophies by the times of their deaths. And um, we find that it's the white media. Now, that's not to excuse um, Malcolm X entirely, because Malcolm X, throughout much of his career, enjoyed tweaking and poking at Martin Luther King. It was to his benefit to try to established Martin Luther King as the safe option, I'm the dangerous option, you know, it, it, it raised his status in many ways. But when push came to shove, and as Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam and became more interested in politics as a tool for solutions and began embracing the opportunity of working with white people, he recognized that he and King had similarities, had things in common and might work together. In fact, Malcolm X went to Selma in an attempt to meet Martin Luther King and found when he got there that King was in jail, but spoke to Coretta Scott King um, and said, tell Dr. King that, I'm, that I know what I'm doing, that I'm hoping I can draw some fire 
and that people might be more inclined to listen to him. So this is a wonderful question and one that I know that um, Ken and Douglas and I had spoken about with slightly different, different framing. But this one says, what are the top three, we, you can give us four if you want, from King and his life that we can take with us to continue this work? And, and maybe in, in, a, in another way, what, what might you say to those in the struggle now channeling King in terms of the work that is before us. So both all of us in our lives, but also relative to the movement that, um, that continues on. Um, and I'd love to hear your response to that one too, but I'll go first and if yeah, okay. you, you want to. That would be great, I would love I, that I would as love well. To hear yours. Um, King, as he came here, the reason he came here to Washington to give that sermon on March 31st, 1968, was because Washington was really scared that he was planning this occupation, really, of Washington, D.C. He called it the Poor People's Campaign. And he was planning to come here in May and to set up a camp within sight of the Capitol and the White House and bring thousands of people from all over the country. And he saw this as a pivot. And he also said it was maybe the last chance for America to redeem itself. He was going to bring people from all races and religions, all parts of the country, with a focus in particular on impoverished people, to stay here in Washington until their demands were met. And what he was demanding was a fundamental restructuring of American society and, and the American economy. The power structure needed to change, and Americans had to sacrifice. He said, white America didn't give up anything when you gave, when, when we passed the Voting Rights Act, when we passed the Civil Rights Act. It didn't cost you anything to allow voters to register. Now it's time to pay. Now it's time to turn the Civil Rights Movement into a human rights movement and to really think deeply about what it means to create equal citizenship. And that scared people. That's why they, they asked him to come to Washington to try to calm the nerves of the mostly white people who would come and hear him speak that day. And King did not, you, you go home and watch the sermon, he did not calm their nerves. He said that the struggle was going to continue, and um, I just spoke to Andrew Young yesterday, and he said one of the quibbles he had with my book is that many people felt like King was losing his way in those last years, and he said King was never going to lose his way. He was going to maintain the same way, that he was going to become more political, he was going to become more radical, he was going to continue on the path, and that had he lived, there's no question that he would have continued the fight. So what do we, so what do we take away from that? I'm you, sorry? You, what, so what, so what, give what us... What can we take away from yeah, that? Yeah, so as you, as you think about the impact of this book and what you hope it gives us and those coming after us, um, the younger generations, I mean, I'm in my 60s now, so I, I count myself not among them anymore, um, but who are feeling many of the feelings that those coming up after King felt and what you would want them to take away from this book um, and the portrait of King that you have painted for us. I wanted to write a book that humanized King because I felt like we've turned him into a monument and a national holiday and a postage stamp, and we've lost sight of the fact that he struggled, that he suffered, that he had doubts, and that he persisted, that he never gave up. And we don't have to be perfect ourselves, but we have to keep working to make a better society. That's what. The Bible says we are meant to work as partners with God in, in improving the universe. And that we can all do. We don't have to be perfect to do it. And I think, and one of the things I've loved about the response to the book so far, I was worried that people would be upset that King comes off as less than perfect in this book. But I think it can only inspire us more to follow in his path if we see that it's a path fraught with doubt and frustration, but also with hope. Yeah, you, in fact, said one of the things uh, 
that I wanted to say is the takeaway and that I think is one of the powerful uh, aspects of your book that we present, you present King as this human being that is very complex and very, uh, in its complexity, also flawed, uh, uh, yet he always tries to make a difference. And we're talking about a 26-year-old who died, was assassinated when he was 39 years old. That's young, right? And so I think when we understand King not as a superhero, as we understand him as a human being, a 26-year-old who came out of school and in fact was still writing his dissertation when he uh, got to Dexter Avenue uh, Baptist Church, then it should inspire us. You don't have to do everything, but you can do something. And that's what King always did. He knew he had to do something. And so that's a takeaway to me that spanned generations. The other thing that struck me in your book, uh, the arc of your book, is the arc that is the cycle of, uh, that is the cycle as, as you spoke about it, Bishop Buddy, progress backlash, progress backlash. And, uh, as Congressman Presley said, we can just transport all that was there to today, and it discourages the generation or two that's beneath me. Uh, uh, and they often say, and this, I guess, turns into a question uh, for you, they often say, uh, we aren't you. <laughs> and I've got my own son that says that. We aren't king, uh, so we aren't that patient as he was, yet I think that that is also some, is a takeaway, that it wasn't a patience, it was an impatience, uh, to even as he knew that these things, uh, there was a backlash. So what, so that's my question to you, what do you say to a generation that says, we aren't king, uh, uh, we aren't you all? Where things have to change now because of the very arc that you trace in your book. Yeah, we, we don't have to be. I mean, we, king wasn't king always either. Yeah. You know, he writes a letter to, after the Montgomery bus boycott, he writes a letter to one of his, his mentors and says, they're going to be expecting me to do this over and over again. <laughs> now what do I do, right? I love that. I love that he didn't know. He didn't know he was going, you know. So we don't have to be king. We just have to try, as you said. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation and an incredibly rich evening. Um, before we let you go, I'd love to have you read one final piece from the, uh, from the epilogue of your book to close us out tonight. I just happened um, to have that here. And a reminder that uh, there is a table in the back for book purchasing and book signing after we finish here on the podium. And so we will give uh, Jonathan Ig a chance to get there. And for those of you who wish to greet him, purchase a book and have him sign it. He'll be waiting there for you. Thank you. Read slowly, too. Nice okay. and slow. Was I too fast last yeah, time? Yeah, a little fast, yeah. Okay, thank you. But in hallowing King, we have hallowed him. From Montgomery to Chicago, along those streets named Martin Luther King Drive and Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and Martin Luther King Jr. Highway and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, Poverty and segregation rates remain much higher than local and national averages. In those schools named for King, and in almost every school in America, King's life and lessons are often smoothed and polished beyond recognition. Young people hear his dream of brotherhood and his wish for children to be judged by the content of their character but not his call for fundamental change in the nation's character, not his cry for an end to the triple evils of materialism, militarism, and racism. As King's friend Harry Belafonte told me, in none of the history books of this country do you read about radical heroes. On my most recent visit to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial in Washington, D.C. in the spring of 2022, I found none of King's books for sale in the gift shop. Our simplified celebration of King comes at a cost. It saps the strength 
of his philosophical and intellectual contributions. It undercuts his power to inspire change. Even after Americans elected a black man as president, and after that president, Barack Obama, placed a bust of King in the Oval Office, the nation remains racked with racism, ethno-nationalism, cultural division, residential and educational segregation, income inequality, violence, and a fading sense of hope that government or anyone will ever fix those problems. Where do we go from here? In spite of the way America treated him, King still had faith when he asked that question. Today, his words might help us make our way through these troubled times, but only if we actually read them, only if we embrace the complicated king, the flawed king, the human king, the radical king, only if we see and hear him clearly again, as America saw and heard him once before. Our very survival, he wrote, depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. Amen. Amen. Please join me in thanking Canon Brown Doug Kelly Brown Douglas, Mr. Jonathan Eig, Congressman Presley. Thank you so much. And we are treated once again by the gift of song. Face, cause 
Stand up, take my people with me. Together we are going to a brand new home. Far across the river, can you hear freedom calling? Calling me to answer, gonna keep on keeping on. I'm gonna stand.